welcome back. Um, I thought we would start off uh, with a more complicated problem where we do, where we have a situation with more than one acceleration uh, for an object to experience and we want to take a look at speeds and distances involved with that. And to do that, I thought the best example for those uh, comes from the space race. Uh, and so I wanted to, to uh, look at rocketry and its history broadly and then go ahead and introduce a problem. So rockets, uh, our earliest rockets um, as humanity uh, were developed over in China using gunpowder and were originally, um, well, widely used uh, as uh, fire arrows in, in warfare. Uh, and that design percolated through, uh, through the world um, and was adapted all over the place. Now, by the time we get to the 19th century, um, imagination has taken hold on a, on a number of folks about what you might be able to use these rockets for for things other than military matters. You have, um, in Russia, uh, engineer and physicist um, uh, Konstantin Tsiolkovsky uh, was one of the um, leading thinkers if, in rocketry as how it might be applied to space travel. Uh, he imagined uh, or he rather he solved uh, how one might be able to use uh, rockets in order to uh, launch things into orbit, including eventually people with space stations and what have you. Um, and this is about a hundred years ago or thereabouts. He, he was working on these ideas in the 1890s and early uh, uh, 1900s. Um, over in the United States, um, contemporary but slightly after uh, Tsiolkovsky, you have Robert Goddard uh, from Worcester, Mass, uh, who developed the first uh, liquid fuel rockets, practical liquid fuel rockets, using gasoline. Um, prior to that, like the gunpowder rockets, they were all solid fuel. That is, the way that the rockets essentially worked uh, was something like this. You have some kind of, you know, here's your body for your rocket, and you have some kind of nozzle uh, in the back, and you have some kind of chamber here where there's a um, chemical reaction going on generating um, heat and gas. Um, and the gas is expelled out the, out the one end, and so the rocket pushes the gas one way, the gas pushes the rocket the other way. Um, and this had been done mainly as stated through gunpowder and um, potentially combined with other substances to uh, aid in the oxidation. Um, but if you had a liquid fuel and pumps and whatnot, you can regulate that flow and control the burn. There were various uh, um, things that made liquid fuel rockets um, more desirable going forward than the solid propelled ones, although today we use both. Um, now, Tsiolkovsky's work had made its way over into Germany, uh, where it had been taken up by Werner von Braun. Uh, and he um, had been working, also wanted to use rocketry to send uh, folks into space. Goddard did as well. Um, wanted to you know, put satellites up, put people into space. Von Braun was very interested in doing that also, um, but 
bad timing for von Braun, right? He was um, uh, becoming you know, more active just as the Nazis were taking over. Um, and he was insufficiently motivated to leave Germany at the time. And in order to continue to do his work, he joined the Nazi party. So, you know, he's not really... A lot of people in Germany joined the Nazi party. But they were not. So, um, and so there is, there's, there's blood on von Braun's hands um, because while he was put in charge of doing, of uh, making rockets for the Nazis, including rockets which carried ordnance uh, to you know, blow up things, like, which put, makes one as culpable as anyone during the war, pres presumably. But as part of his um, Nazi affiliation and the rocket program in general, they were using slave labor. So I think you know, people from the camps were working on mines and such in order to supply fuel and whatnot for, um, for the rocket program. Um, and nonetheless, the technical parts went something like this. First, von Braun had as a weapon, earlier form of the rockets uh, that were used was uh, known as the V1, uh, which was a liquid fuel rocket, uh, but it also had wings on it because it was you know, suborbital. It was, it was supposed to stay in the atmosphere. So it looks sort of like a big baseball bat with wings, only you know, larger. Um, and the fuel delivery sputtered, uh, so it had made like a buzzing sound. So think like a flying Harley Davidson motorcycle that explodes when it hits. Um, yeah. So the the Brits referred to these things as buzz bombs uh, at the time. But he was working on other versions of these. And again, he lamented by around the time that the V1s were in operation and raining down uh, ordnance upon uh, Britain and whatnot, he was complaining about not directing the rocket program towards uh, launching things into space. He was expressing a desire to do non-military things. Oh, he's still doing the military things anyway, and he's exploiting the labor. And, uh. So, he does these things. And the next design uh, winds up being uh, revolutionary uh, and sort of the basis of sort of the, um, the core design that became used both by the Americans and the Soviets following that. So this V2 rocket looked more like your um, pulp novel cigar-shaped rockets with the, with the fins at the bottom. Uh, and you'd have black and white alternating fins so that the, and like these stripes going across the thing so that as the thing rotated and you could note the flashing with the black and white on it, you could gauge how rapidly the thing was spinning to get some diagnostics while it was flying. But the V2 rocket, those were developed and began to be launched and used as weapons in 1944, but already by that time, um, as far as the war was going, the Soviets were coming in from uh, on the Eastern Front, the Americans were coming in from the South and from the West, 
and uh, von Braun and his team decided that uh, it, what the, the Germans were not winning this one and it was time to figure out whom to surrender to. Uh, they decided that Stalin was not going to be any better than the guy they were about to get rid of. So they looked to try to surrender to the um, Americans and they, um, they headed to the south. They held, holed up in, the, in a camp in the mountains. They stuffed a lot of the rocket plans and whatnot in, a, in an abandoned mine. And von Braun sent his brother Magnus, who was also a rocket engineer, to go to the Americans to surrender. And they accepted his surrender. He was on like a watch list. Uh, and so von Braun and a team of um, German rocket engineers surrendered to the Americans, got taken off to um, a holding area in a castle called the Dustbin, where British and American intelligence examined them and tried to figure out, okay, are these folks war criminals? In which case, they need to be prosecuted. Are they not war criminals? Are they useful war criminals that we can gloss over some stuff? A lot of scientists with not so clean backgrounds had them papered over in a operation called Operation Paperclip, and you can look that up and were given new identities and somewhat obscured backgrounds so that they would be used by other governments after the war. Um, von Braun was less directly considered to be responsible and also considered to be a bigger asset. And so the conclusion was he was not any more responsible than a random person connected. But he was officially a member of the SS. So there you go. But still, he'd rather not be working on weapons. He wanted to send things into space. He gets brought over to the US. The US would like to have him working on rockets for weaponry. Um, and not for sending things into space. Um, and so he's working, and, and he begins to work uh, down in Texas and later in Huntsville, Alabama, uh, working on rocketry that's associated with the military uh, in order to deliver ordnance uh, long distances in sort of an extension of the same sorts of things that he was doing uh, for the Germans during the 40s. Um, only now, the U.S. had nuclear ordnance that could go and be carried along as well. And so did the Soviets. And a, uh, a Soviet engineer by the name of Sergei Korolev was, um, for a long time we didn't know this person's name outside of the Soviet Union, he was just referred to as the engineer. Um, he had a lot of experience, he uh, had some trouble being on the right side politically with various folks uh, immediately before and during the war, but folks understood that he had this uh, valuable understanding about rocketry. He also, like Tsiolkovsky, like Goddard, like von Braun, preferred the idea of using it to end up satellites and put people into space. But the folks who were looking to fund things wanted to do more stuff that was military oriented. Um, and the Soviets uh, had taken over areas where a number of the rocket development that von Braun's team had uh, worked on had been taking place. And so they recovered some of the material that von Braun had worked on uh, back then as well and incorporated that into 
the development of their own rocket program. So, in the mid 50s, uh, both the Soviet teams and uh, von Braun's American teams were developing rockets mainly to throw nuclear weapons at each other. Uh, and However, the push to be able to send things into orbit did continue with lesser funding, but it was given more focus over in the Soviet Union. And then in October of 1957, the Soviets were able to launch the first artificial satellite, uh, Sputnik, uh, which was basically a proof of concept object that had a radio signal. Um, I've stood near a they, they made multiple ones, like one of them flew, and they made multiple other ones that didn't fly. And they're, like, the ball part of it is about yay big. And then there are, like, these four antennae that come off the back of it. Um, and so it's not very big, but it's still bright enough that folks could see it passing overhead. And they know it could pass overhead anywhere in the United States and the Soviet Union also has nuclear weapons, which means they could deliver nuclear, weapon, deliver nuclear weapons anywhere to the United States. And so things kicked up a notch with the space race. So October 57, the Soviets sent up Sputnik 1. November 57, they sent up a dog named Laika and looked at what happened with her up in space. They didn't really design things so that she could come home, but they did that. Um, and the uh, Russians and the US sent uh, various animals up on suborbital flights in rockets. So they would go up into space, but not all the way around the earth and come back down. Um, and eventually by, uh, the um, early 50s, or the late 50s, the early 60s, uh, folks had sent, um, you know, the US had sent uh, rhesus monkeys and eventually chips, chimpanzees by 1960 uh, to go uh, into space and return. Uh, the Soviets had sent uh, collections of animals uh, up and down, um, you know, brought them back alive on both sides. Yes, 61 in uh, April, uh, Yuri Gagarin uh, becomes the first human being to be launched into space uh, and return. Uh, and he make, does a full orbit um, from the Soviet Union uh, in a um, capsule called Vostok, uh, which means like dawn. Um, and so, they uh, get the first person up before first folks in the U.S. do. The U.S. knows that this is coming, they're working on stuff, and they look to try to get ahead. And the way they do this is they've got a rocket that they know already works that they're using for an intercontinental ballistic missile. And so they have this rocket, and it's they have built the darn thing with von Braun's team um, in, in um, Huntsville, Alabama at the Redstone Arsenal. And so this is a Redstone rocket and it had this warhead on top and again the alternating color so when it spins you know what rate it's doing it at. They took off the capsule, they took off the, the warhead and stuck on a one-person crew capsule and then called this Mercury capsule, and that was what the first two uh, human-carrying rockets were for the United States. The Redstone rock, the Mercury Redstone rockets, which carried Alan the Shepard and Gus Grissom uh, in the first and second U.S. flights. Now that we've had all that preamble, let's look at the problem. So. One, you launched this thing. When Alan Shepard went up, um, it had an acceleration 
um, originally of, uh, let's see, let's do this sort of like this. Okay, so we start off at rest, zero meters per second, and it goes, and it goes um, for um, one minute, for two minutes and 22 seconds. So that's 142 seconds. And it does that, the acceleration makes a maximum of about 6.3 times the speed, the acceleration of gravity. So like, um, so about like 60-ish meters per second squared. But on average, it's going at like, uh, more like 1.7 G. So about, let's call it about 1.7 meters per second. No, 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 sorry. Let's call it 17 meters per second squared uh, for A1 average. And so first thing we want to know is, um, well, if that went straight up, and it doesn't, it's aimed eastward over the ocean, but let's pretend it goes straight up. If it goes straight up, um, what is the velocity when the engine's cut off, and what's the height when the engine's cut off? That's the first part of the problem, but there's going to be more, because at that point, there are like explosive bolts here that blow off, and the rocket, which no longer has any fuel in it, gets dropped, and the capsule still has all that speed. So it's like somebody, it's like you took like a really long pitch to throw something up in the air and let go of it. Well, now it's operating with gravity alone. And so then, its acceleration is negative g, negative 9.8 meters per second squared. But it still gets to go up, and so we want to know, let's see, its v final, when it reaches its max height is zero, we want to know what uh, delta x2 is. How high does it get above that original height? So, how's that work? Well, it's really, it's two problems. It's kind of like the problem we did in the previous video where we figured out how fast a person can jump in one problem and then took that information and dumped it into another situation where there was a different acceleration see how high somebody could jump on Mars with different acceleration. So, first part of the problem, we want to know some final position and some final velocity given acceleration time and initial conditions. We check out what we've got here. We have, we're looking for that final velocity. Um, we're looking for that final position. And looks like our first two equations are sufficient. Um, they both only have one unknown. Those unknowns are the things we're looking for. So let's do um, the first one first. Let's find the velocity. So we go v1 minus zero for V zero equals A delta T. So that's 17 times 142. And now I need um, calculator here. Sorry, I had to get the calculator. So 17 uh, times 142 yields 2,414. Uh, so we'll call that 
2400 meters per second. Um, and then the height is going to be um, x0, which was 0, plus v0, delta t, also 0, plus 1 half a delta t squared. So that's um, 1 half times 7 times 142 squared. 142 squared divided by 2 times 17. Okay, so that is 171 uh, and change meters. So about 171 kilometers up. Now I know from history that it didn't get up that high. Uh, we were angled at, um, you know, he wasn't going straight up the whole time, he was going off eastward. Um, but that's where it would be if he had gone straight up. Um, but how high does he get after that? Okay, let's find out. Um, so, second part of the problem, we, um, we do know the final velocity, we don't know the final distance, um, and we don't know the time now of flight. So, So it looks like this bottom equation is the, our best bet for solving um, our additional height while we're in free fall. So let's do that. Um, v final squared minus v1 squared equals 2a2 delta x2. Um, that's zero. Delta x2 is negative v1 squared over 2a2. Um, that's negative 2400 squared over two times negative 9.8. Okay, so 2400 squared divided by 19.6. All right, so that is uh, about 294,000 meters. So just under 300 kilometers. So when we add the two together to get the total height, um, that's our 29, our 294 kilometers plus our 171 kilometers. Um, so let's erase a little bit. x final minus x2 um, equals, let's see, or minus x1 equals delta x2. Um, x1 minus x0 equals delta x1. So, x final equals delta x2 plus x1. Um, that's 294 kilometers 
plus 171 kilometers um, so that's 465 kilometers which that's you know that's like space station altitude um, is around 400 kilometers up um, but the speed that they were traveling at um, would not be sufficient to sustain an orbit uh, I would need to go faster for that so that required the Mercury Atlas rocket, the next version uh, for the Mercury program, and uh, in the United States, John Glenn got to ride that one and take three laps around, uh, but already uh, a few other Soviets had made some orbits uh, before Glenn got up for that one. Um, and we'll leave that at there.